Television's Automotive Magazine. Finally, that long-awaited two-seater sports car from Pontiac is going to come. Now, we've been calling that thing the P-Car, but they've come up with a new name for it, and it's called the Fiero, and that means very proud in Italian. Now, the first model is going to be called the Fiero 2M4, and that's simple, two-seat, mid-engine, four-cylinder. Now, look for that last number to change depending on the engine configuration. Now, that's going to be out next fall as an 84 model. That's right. Correct? Not the Firebird 2? No. <laughs> I can't say I'm not disappointed. Okay, Joyce, keep on spying. Thanks okay. very much. You know, it's not easy to be different in a large corporation like General Motors. As proof, take our four-wheeled friend here, the Pontiac Fiero 2M4. It was over five years before the Fiero reached production, nearly twice as long as usual for a new design. Part of that reason, Pontiac had to sell the Fiero to GM Brass, not as a sports car, but as a very small, you see it's less than 13 and a half feet long, two-seat commuter car that just happens to be fun to drive. But during the course of development, something strange happened. The energy crisis was officially forgotten. So while the base version still fits that high mileage image, make no mistake about it, this is a sports car. And the full sporty pretensions of the design can now be openly explored, which is just what we're going to do. First, the translation. In Italian-American, Fiero 2M4 means a very proud, two-body, mid-mounted engine, four-cylinder sweetheart. And how sweet it is when it comes to handling. The near-perfect placement of the engine is just behind the driver, but just ahead of the rear wheels. That makes the Fiero feel like it's on rails as it twists around a fast bend. The stiffer springs and shocks of the handling package and sticky 14-inch Eagle GT tires are standard on this up-level SE model. So Wet-dry adhesion is excellent and spins almost impossible. The Fiero is relatively heavy, 2,590 pounds and its engine output is only 92 horsepower and 134 pounds of torque. Even with those figures, its average speed through our tight slalom was 45 miles an hour, most impressive. The F in Fiero must stand for flat, since body roll is almost unnoticed by either the driver or the eye. While moderate understeer is present, the back end has no nervous traits. The only drawback to all this fun is the very slow steering. The rack and pinion system has no power assist. It takes a lot of steering wheel work to maneuver a narrow course. Since the Fiero comes with only a four-speed manual or three-speed automatic, there aren't enough gears to match the engine's modest output when you get into trouble, like trying to power out of a high-speed skid. So the Fiero is best driven by careful use of the four-wheel disc brakes and a heavy throttle. But then, isn't that how you always drove a real sports car? Aside from that, MotorWeek found the available power quite adequate. Acceleration times were above average for modern cars. Zero to 60 came in at 11.2 seconds. You do run through first gear rapidly, but a time of 9.1 seconds over a 500-foot on-ramp course certainly qualifies as quick. It's no slouch in the 40 to 55 mile per hour passing time either, 4.5 seconds. Smooth starts are hard to come by, since you have to master the slap engaging clutch. But once rolling, we again awarded a good show for a 17.6 second, 74 mile per hour quarter mile. Even better straight line performance will come when a V6 is added next year. And we'll add another accolade for Fiero brakes. While a bit touchy, with a tendency for the rear wheels to lock up first, all in all, they're very secure. Fade is modest and stops were straight with a very short average of 125 feet from 55 miles per hour. The pedal was firm and made it easy for the driver to know just how hard to push for any given situation. We'd expect only two complaints from everyday drivers. First, the very heavy low speed steering effort. And second, the extremely wide 40 foot turning diameter. All potential owners of slight build might wish to put in a few Charles Atlas sessions first. 
And for that matter, the Fiero's Porsche lookalike emblem does imply that the first year's 85,000 units aren't for everyone. But if you do apply, you'll not only get a slick car to drive, but one that's slick looking too. The all plastic body panels were smooth with excellent fit and finish. To protect against minor dings, the front fenders are flexible and have the same type paint as the harder panels. This reduces the problem of irregular fading found on cars using pliable plastic in the past. Almost everything on the Fiero has been given careful attention and compromises kept to a minimum. The interior is first rate. It feels much roomier than most sports cars, including the much larger Corvette. Seats are very comfy with stereo speakers located in each headrest. Instrumentation is nearly complete and highly legible. Everything is electronic, including the speedometer. And in the small favors department, they give you a dial rather than the ubiquitous digital face. Thank you, Pontiac. And thanks for making the left-hand parking brake lever always rest in a down position. At least crawling into the low cockpit is no more difficult than it has to be. Another kudo for placing the gear shift lever high on the console so your arm can easily pivot to and from the wheel. Now if they can only do something about the long, stiff shift linkage, always a problem in mid-engine cars. Pontiac had also better instruct their dealers on how to show the best use of the Fiero's small but deceptively good cargo space. The deep cavity behind the engine takes one hard-sided three-suiter or a few soft bags. In fact, Pontiac will offer a special set of Fiero luggage as an option. And Duffers will be glad to know that the main design criteria for the Fiero's short hip wide bay was a combination of two standard golf bags. After a day on the greens, you can change into your dress blazer, kept in a garment bag behind the seats. Now, if they'd only included something to hang it on. You might be able to squeeze it under the front bay along with the radiator, spare tire, and braking components. The engine and transaxle, the 2.5 liter Iron Duke unit, is housed transversely directly behind the cockpit. It looks like a devil to service, but it's actually, again, the most accessible mid-engine installation yet devised. Most major components are reachable from both above and below the car. Such attention to servicing is also noticeable in the front wishbone suspension. The shocks are offset towards the rear rather than inside the coil springs for quick and easy change. While we have approached the Fiero as a sports car, Pontiac has tried to keep it faithful to the original commuter car image. Mileage ratings are high, 27 city and 48 highway. However, our very young test sample never exceeded 29. With age, we would expect between 35 and 40 in everyday driving. But if the Fiero is so well conceived and executed, it must also cost a bundle, right? Well, like life, it's all relative and depends on what you want. Using loads of off-the-shelf parts, let Pontiac price the base version at a dollar under 8,000. The fully decked out price is under 12 grand. So with great handling and adequate power, the beautifully styled Pontiac Fiero 2M4 has got to be the enthusiastic commuter's bargain of the year. Let's see what Pontiac has done for its newest performer, the sassy mid-engine Fiero. With last year's Indy Pace Car Aero styling package, a new Fiero GT comes up to the line. With rocker panel extensions and the optional rear spoiler, this latest Fiero looks the part of a high-velocity, pavement-gripping sports car. But are the looks deceiving? Well, not if the four outlet twin exhaust pipes mean what they should. A V6 option is now available on all Fieros. It'll cost you $522 on most models, and it's standard equipment on the $14,542 Fiero GT. It's a multi-port fuel-injected 2.8-liter unit like the 6,000 STEs, but thanks to the Fiero's lower exhaust system restriction, it generates 140 horsepower and 170 pounds of torque. The standard transmission for the V6 is the four-speed manual we last saw in Chevy's Citation X11. 
but it was the added cost three-speed automatic that came in our Fiero GT test car. And it arrived just in time for a trip to Pennsylvania's Pocono International Raceway. On Pocono's high bank two and a half mile trioval, we clocked our Fiero GT at 110, with a top speed probably nearer 115. Now that's about a 10% gain over the four cylinder four speed Fiero SE that we tested last year. With far more low and mid range torque, acceleration times also improved. A 0 to 60 sprint was 15% faster at 9.3 seconds. With a manual, it might be more like 8.3. And the quarter mile that we rated good in the original Fiero is now downright quick at 16.7 seconds and 80 miles per hour. But with 2,700 V6 equipped pounds to pull around, our Fiero GT seemed heavier and slower than our clocks indicated. That weight, however, and the 60 Series Eagle GT tires, along with a slight tweaking of the Fiero's performance suspension, have made this a better balanced sports car. On Pocono's infield road course, the Fiero GT exhibited more front tire scrub than expected, but precise throttle adjustments gave excellent control. Into a corner too fast? Just back off the gas and the rear will swing out for the turn. Then get back on the throttle and the rear wheels will continue to push the nose along the proper course. Negatives we noticed? Well, major expansion joints produced a lot of front to rear hop and the manual rack and pinion steering, while fine at speed, is very heavy for everyday around town use. The brakes also faded more than we would have liked, although an overall stopping distance of 130 feet from 55 is a good result. So while the short history of the Fiero has been bright and the additions for 85 well received, Pontiac still has much more in store for future Fieros. Next year, 15-inch wheels will come with the top tire option, and a five-speed manual will be optional with the V6. In 87, look for a new suspension that should be more bump resistant and a novel form of power assist to reduce low-speed steering effort. As time drives on, so does car design, and Pontiac with the Fiero and the 6000 STE seems determined to arrive ahead of the others. Which brings us to 1986 and a half and the $12,875 Fiero GT. Last year's GT brought V6 power to the Fiero, but Pontiac and lots of performance car enthusiasts felt the car needed another injection of sportiness. So Pontiac gave the Fiero GT, and only the GT, a whole new look with clear sailplane quarter panels and a Firebird look-alike tail end. But bodywork is a matter of taste. Has the Fiero GT improved as a sports car? Well, inside, the answer is yes, even though changes are few. Instrumentation has been upgraded. The temperature gauge is now located in the center of the instrument cluster, and it's joined by an oil pressure gauge and voltmeter on top of the center console. They're not in the direct line of sight, but they also have large warning lights built in just to get your attention. Our car's four-speed manual shifter was the most precise we'd found in any Fiero yet, but the lever is still too tall and positioned too far back for most drivers. And that long-awaited five-speed manual, well, it's still not ready for production. But the Fiero's port-injected 2.8-liter V6 has plenty of power, and four gears seem quite sufficient, thank you. That engine was added last year. But since this year's GT has gained a few pounds, thanks to the extra skin, acceleration times were just slightly slower. It's still pretty quick. Quarter mile time was 16.2 seconds at 85 miles per hour. Likewise, 0 to 60, 8.5 seconds. The 2.8 V6 is one of our favorites for its smoothness, low RPM power, and especially for its lively exhaust notes, something a good sports car really should have. And Pontiac must have had that in mind when they upgraded the GT suspension. In addition to different shock valving and spring rates, they added 15-inch tires, 205-60s at the front, 215-60s at the rear. But we're sorry to say it didn't really improve the Fiero's handling much. The steering is still too heavy, and there's a lot of initial plow and in cutting into a turn. In the slalom, the Fiero GT does anything but encourage you to drive faster. 
When you do drive fast and have to make an emergency maneuver, you have to do it carefully. Lift off the throttle in the middle of a turn, as many drivers would in this situation, and this could be the result, a textbook example of excessive trailing throttle oversteer. Here's the same thing again, at the same speed, but without lifting off the gas. You can see there's still quite a bit of twitchiness. So while the latest GT is the most performance-oriented Fiero yet, changes this year did more for appearance than for spirit. It still doesn't hold a candle to the Firebird Trans Am for excitement. What it needs now is the promised new suspension, and soon. But we'll still give Pontiac lots of credit. When you have strong parents and a big family, it's hard to keep your individuality. Pontiac has made excellent strides, and their Grand Am SE, Fiero GT, and other models have become performance standouts in the GM clan. It's now the 1988 model year, and the Fiero's dawn has finally arrived. Appropriately, Pontiac's little son is sporting a fresh, bright yellow paint scheme to mark the debut of its new steering and suspension systems. Pontiac put their money where their press releases are, too, by letting automotive riders have a first crack at this true sports car Fiero on the demanding Mid-Ohio Raceway. It didn't take long to feel the differences from past Fieros. Gone are the sluggish manual steering and heavy front-end plow of the car's original Chevette-based front suspension. The Fiero now steers with precision and can be tossed from one curve to the next, exhibiting fine agility. The Fiero is the first production car with a new electro-hydraulic power steering system. Since the Fiero's engine is behind the driver, a conventional engine-driven steering pump is impractical. The Fiero power steering system uses an electric motor to drive the hydraulics. That also means that if the engine quits unexpectedly, power steering is retained as long as the ignition is on. Steering boost is speed sensitive too, with full assist for parking and city creeping. At highway speeds, behavior is close to that of manual. More important, however, is the new coil spring front suspension. It not only makes the car handle better, but its geometry also reduces the Fiero's turning circle. At the rear, a new tri-link design includes softer springs and more apt wheel movement for a smoother ride and improved road holding on rough pavement. Combined with past improvements like the multi-port injected V6 engine and the Getrag 5-speed manual transaxle, the 1988 Fiero now seems a cohesive sports car design. And if you think that all this means a lot higher price tag, Pontiac is also introducing a bargain formula package that includes most optional Fiero performance hardware. We'll be putting the 1988 Fiero through our full road test procedure soon to see if its transformation to a true sports car is really complete. The Toyota MR2 and the Pontiac Fiero have long been popularity leaders among the two-seat sports coupe brigade. And this year, the competition between the two of them promises to really heat up. The Fiero GT has a new suspension and power steering, while the MR2 has a formidable new supercharged power plant. Well, we decided it was time that East met West to find out which car was really superior. The confrontation began last summer at racetracks over 2,000 miles apart. Toyota had leased the fast Portland International Raceway to show off the new speed of its supercharged MR2. Meanwhile, Pontiac was doing much the same thing for the revamped Fiero GT at the twisty Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. Pontiac also had something else up its sleeve, a new Fiero model called the Formula. Like their Firebird formula, it put high-performance hardware in bargain model styling. And it was this GT in street clothes Fiero formula that we requested to put up against the supercharged MR2 at a third track, Georgia's Roebling Road Raceway. But first, some basics. 
Ever since its introduction in 1984, the biggest shortcoming of the Fiero was its heavy, unsports car like handling. It drove far more like the Chevy Chevette on which its front suspension was based. Well, four years later, new underpinnings have arrived. The front suspension uses coil springs in a more compact design than before. The stabilizer bar is thicker, and the overall geometry not only improves ride and handling, but makes for a shorter turning radius. At the rear is a tri-link design with lower spring rates and more rearward wheel movement for a smoother ride. Rough pavement road holding is also supposed to be improved. The one new feature our Fiero did not have is the electromechanical power steering system. Its availability is delayed until at least late spring. The powertrain of the Fiero formula is like last year's GT, a multi-port injected 2.8 liter V6 delivering 135 horsepower and 165 pound-feet of torque. Standard on the formula is the GM Getrag 5-speed. It works well, though it is a bit notchy, and the shift lever is too high for smooth operation. Over at the Toyota side of our pits, the MR2 has a 16-valve four-cylinder. The same basic engine that's powered it since 1985. Only now, it's the first modern production engine to use a supercharger. It breathes through an air-to-air -air intercooler, much the way better turbo-powered cars do. All told, this engine produces 30% more power than the standard MR2 engine. Ratings are a healthy 145 horsepower and 140 pound-feet of torque. The standard gear change is also a five-speed manual. Shifts are crisp with short throws. Since the MR2 weighs 250 pounds less than the Fiero, it should come as no surprise that it is faster. Zero to 60 was a very fast 6.5 seconds on our 30-degree day. Over the quarter mile, we recorded 15.4 seconds and a speed of 90. The supercharged power comes on rapidly without the lag usually associated with turbochargers, and the engine pulls strongly to well past 6,000 RPM. The clutch is light, maybe too light, and fast shifts come easy. But all this power does have its price. Noise. There's a lot going on behind your head, and you hear every decibel. By comparison, the Fiero is almost quiet during hard acceleration. And thanks to the broader torque curve of the V6, it's almost as fast. Zero to 60 took 7.5 seconds, and the quarter mile ran 15.7 seconds at 87 miles per hour. Neither the clutch or shifter are as fluid as in the MR2, but they are worlds better than they were four years ago. Otherwise, the interior of the plain Jane Fiero is much as before. You sit very low with your legs pretty much straight out in front of you. You step over the parking brake that remains lowered even when engaged. The seat could use more side bolster support to keep you in place during fast turns. Some of our drivers had to wedge a knee against the door to keep from sliding around. The Fiero GT seats have much better support. Over the years, there have been several changes in the Fiero's large backlit and easy to read analog gauges. However, lack of space requires that some engine readouts reside in a separate pod above the center console. Straightforward controls for the temperature, ventilation, and radio reside below. They work well, but are hard to reach for most drivers. Thanks to its taller body, getting in the MR2 is easier than in the Fiero, but there's a snugger fit here. We do prefer its more chair-like seats, but the side bolsters are so high that wider drivers feel pinned in. Then again, both of these models are two-seat sports cars, not four-door sedans. Gauges are clear, analog, backlit, and all arranged in front of the driver. A green light tells you when the supercharger is working. While the rest of the dash retains its original piece-together look, all controls are within easy reach and are simple to understand. That's good, since the last thing you want to do at speed in the supercharged MR2 is be distracted. While the MR2 always handled well, there is now more than enough power to quickly explore its cornering limits. Our staff was very divided on the handling of the MR2. Some felt its slot car nature made it a ball to drive fast. Others felt the MR2 felt insecure, too easy to push beyond its limits. At peak cornering power, the tail can unexpectedly twitch around, and the car is so throttle sensitive that it's hard to apply just the right amount to keep the car composed. By contrast, the Fiero formula was extremely predictable and felt solid even near its slightly lower cornering limits. 
The new suspension still pushes into turns, but now only mildly. The manual steering is precise with good road feel. And the steering wheel won't pull out of your hands over bumps quite as badly as it used to. Now that the Fiero's front can make turns, we were also impressed at how well the back end followed suit. There was none of the twitchy rear end complaints found in our last two tests of Fiero GTs. Even the slower revving V6 didn't bother us, since there was always enough power when needed. Since most owners of these cars will spend 99.9% .9 of their driving time on roads rather than racetracks, it follows that these must be practical cars too. Fuel economy is quite good on the MR2, with ratings of 24 city and 30 highway. The Fiero is thirstier at 18 city and 28 highway, but still very acceptable for a sports car. With engines in the rear, both use the front bay for components. In the Fiero's case, there is little room for anything besides a few tools or a shaving kit. The rear luggage compartment, however, is deep. It will take a small golf bag, a design requirement, or this flexible-sided luggage. A hanging suit bag will also fit behind the front passenger seat. The MR2 has enough space up front for a briefcase or a soft overnight bag. But while its rear compartment looks as big as the Fiero, it was not quite deep enough for our suitcase. Neither car had a problem with engine heat trying to overheat our luggage. We also did our best to overheat the brakes on these two two-seat sprinters. Both used disc all round. However, those on the MR2 were very touchy in panic stops and would fade fairly rapidly at racetrack speed. Stops from 55 averaged 126 feet, with some premature locking at the front right wheel. The Fiero's disc brakes were much easier to modulate and suffered from less hard use fade. In our brake test, distances were shorter than for the MR2 at 118 feet from 55. We did notice the right rear wanted to lock up during the last few feet of travel. Pedal feel was solid. As for price, the Fiero formula begins at $11,000, with our car totaling $13,000. The racier GT has all of our car's equipment standard plus fastback bodywork. It costs $14,000. By comparison, the supercharged MR2 begins at $16,400. Our car was loaded and tipped the price sheet at just over $19,000. By our figuring, the most expensive Fiero GT you can buy would cost only slightly more than the least expensive supercharged MR2. So, which one is more super than the other, and for whom? Well, we know that the MR2 is faster, both in a straight line and around a racing circuit. It also has the best seats and the most noise. While the reliability of its supercharger is unknown, Toyota quality is well known. The Fiero, however, is a far more comfortable car to drive hard, and it is only a little slower than the MR2. It also has better brakes, and its engine is less complicated. Its reliability record has improved to acceptable, and it is far less expensive than the supercharged MR2. So, while the MR2 now has the power to match its suspension and is generally a thrill to drive, overall we would rather live with the Fiero. And on the racetrack, it allowed us to be less than 100% attentive at all times and still have fun. The only sad part is that it took Pontiac four years to get the Fiero right. We hope it's not too late. We recently tested Pontiac's upgraded 88 Fiero, liked the improvements, and we said we hoped it wasn't too late for them to make a difference. It was too late. Earlier this month, Pontiac announced it would end production of its two-seat sports car. Fiero's sales for the first two months of 88 were down 38% over the same period last year. But according to a spokesman for Pontiac, there's more to the Fiero's demise. Underutilization of Fiero's assembly plant was another consideration, as well as slow projected growth for the market segment in which the Fiero competes. And one reason for that slow growth is high insurance premiums. Pontiac says they expect would-be Fiero buyers to turn to other sporty models in the Pontiac line. Fiero production will end at the close of the 88 model year.